Sorry. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Dynamics. Let's quickly recap the contents of week number one. We introduced particles. And we had talked about a particle moving through space. And we described a particle with respect to a coordinate system. So we introduced, for example, our Cartesian coordinate system down here. E1, E2, E3, and all other kinds of directions that we may need. And we had introduced a position vector, this, we call it R. And then, of course, this particle can have a velocity, which we call it V. And the particle may also have some acceleration that may point in a different direction. That we call A. And this is how we describe the motion of a particle, and that's what we call the kinematics of a particle. Importantly, we'd introduce the relations between these three vectors. If the position is given by r of t, then the velocity is nothing else but the derivative of that position, the vector, with respect to time, and the acceleration is nothing else but the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. So far, so good. These things we probably even know from high school physics. The most important point here is that r, v, and a, all of those are vectors. And we have to be very careful when we work with vectors and we differentiate them, because we can express them in many different frames. What we see down here is a Cartesian coordinate system, a fixed one. e1, e2, and possibly also e3 are fixed in space. They're not moving, they're not changing. And that's our fixed Cartesian coordinate system. And what that means is if I want to write, for example, my coordinates in a Cartesian frame, then my position vector is nothing else but r equals the sum over i from 1 to whatever dimension you're in, xi times ei. And as a consequence, when I take derivatives, let's say I want, for example, the velocity, this will be nothing else but now take a time derivative. We put a dot on top of our components, of our coordinates over here, and ei remains unchanged because that system down here is fixed. It's not changing with time. And of course, likewise, you get the same for the acceleration. This is convenient. It allows us to derive all three of those. Sometimes, even if we have only partial knowledge, we may know some about the velocity, something about the acceleration or about the position, and we can use these relations over here to relate them to each other or to find the missing information. Sometimes it's not very convenient to use Cartesian coordinates, and that's why we introduced two other coordinate systems. The second one we talked about was polar coordinates. And polar coordinates are always essential and always beneficial when something is moving on a somewhat circular path. For example, let's consider a particle. Let me draw this uh, somewhere down here. And let's assume that this particle is moving on a circular trajectory of some sort. In this case, what we do is we introduce a vector from the fixed center to over here. This is what I call the distance r. And I introduce an angle. Let me call this phi. Sometimes we call it theta. And in this reference frame, I can now introduce two basis vectors that move with the particle. There's a radial one that's pointing outward. That's what we call ER for radial. And there's a tangential one that's pointing in the positive phi direction, tangential to the path. That's what we call E phi. And of course, now we can also describe any of these vectors in our system here. What is essential is in this coordinate system, E phi and ET, uh, ER, I'm sorry, are functions of time. If you now want to take derivatives, you have to be very careful. The position vector is simple. That's nothing else but the current radius in the ER direction, right? You want to find this point, all you go is in the ER direction by distance r. When it comes to velocities, we have to be a little careful, because when I take time derivatives, I cannot simply put a dot on top of the r, because my er also depends on time. And this leads to the interesting relations we derived in class. For example, the velocity is now r dot times er, motion in the radial direction, plus, and there's the second point, r times phi dot times e phi. It's the motion in the tangential uh, direction. This over here is the vr component, and this over here is the v phi component. And note that we often also take this phi dot as the angular velocity and call it omega. Now, this is the velocity. Of course, the same also trickles down to the acceleration. If we do one more time derivative, again, we have to differentiate the basis vectors. And we have to be careful. We cannot simply take vr dot down here because it's a contribution from the basis. And so this leads to a more complicated fashion. For example, here we would have 
something which looks like this, right? And here we get our r dot to r dot phi dot plus r phi double dot e phi. If you don't know these by heart, don't worry. You'll find them in the formula collection. We derived them for you, essentially. But the most important thing is going from here to here and here to here is non-trivial. Because, for example, this a phi here is not the same as v phi dot. And the same applies to vr. But it's our choice. We can use this description. We can use that description. Whatever is most convenient to us. In all of these cases, we apply these universal rules up here. These never change. These are our universal rules that we can apply to any coordinate system. It's our choice to decide which coordinate system we want to use. The third and last one I quickly want to show you is the space curve description. This one is most convenient if a particle is not moving on a circular path, but on some other given path. For example, let's say our particle is moving on a certain track. And this is the particle and is moving along. What we do here is we use the path length, s of t, as the descriptor, as the one that describes where the particle has moved after you know, a certain time. And in this case, it's most convenient to, again, decompose the velocity in a certain way. Namely, what we do is we introduce first a tangential component. This would be our E tangential. And then we introduce a normal component to the ground. And here it's important to find the right direction, this way or that way. That's what we call E normal. The way to think about this is at any point on the curve, you can always think about drawing a circle which is tangential to that point. And that circle defines En because we have to point inward towards the center of that circle. There's another important thing, this distance from here to here, that's the so-called local radius of curvature, rho, that is essential. And this holds for any curved path that we can describe, because at any point we can always describe these directions, tangential and normal, and we can always compute a local radius of curvature. And with that, we can essentially write down the analogous uh, expressions that we have. For example, the velocity in this case is nothing else but s dot times et. Why? Because at any point on the curve, we're simply moving along the curve. That's what describes the path. We cannot be lifting off because our description is along the path. And so that means this is s dot is simply the velocity with which we're moving along the path. That's the velocity you know, at which you're driving on a certain curved path on the ground. And when it comes to the acceleration, and that's the one we will need a lot starting next week, we've seen that it has two components. It has s double dot times et. This is the acceleration along the path. So if you're driving your car and you're accelerating, you're accelerating in the direction of the path, and that's exactly this term over here. There's a second component, and that's essential, and the second one is plus v squared divided by rho times en. And this second one here means that there is also a normal component of the acceleration. So if you're moving along a curved path, this one will be there. It depends quadratically on your speed, where v is nothing else but my s dot. And it depends inversely on rho. This is the radius of curvature. So if you're on a flat ground, the radius of curvature goes to infinity, and you would not see that term back here. You would only have the first one. So if you're driving your car on a flat scene, you only have acceleration along the path. You're not lifting off. Why would you? But if you go into looping, for example, there will be an acceleration in this case given by that term over here. Or if you're driving across you know, the top of a mountain, there will be an acceleration. And what we see here is the following. In this case, we have a term which looks like that. This is pretty much a generalization of what we had for polar coordinates. Because a circle is, of course, nothing else but a special case of a space curve. In fact, that's the last thing I want to show. If we take this case over here and take the special case of r being constant, where we're moving on a circular path, let's take this as a special case, everything simplifies a lot, especially our acceleration then becomes what? Our double dot is zero, so all we're having is minus r phi dot squared times er, and from here we're getting plus r phi double dot e phi. And if I now do the simple trick of noticing that, where is it? r times phi dot up here is the velocity uh, along the path. That means I can also rewrite this as minus v squared over r times er plus r phi double dot e phi. If we now compare these two, what we notice is this term here is pretty much analogous to that one. 
The difference in sign comes from the fact that here our ER points out of the center of the circle and here it points into the circle. But otherwise they are really the same. So if you're on a circular path, this is the acceleration that kind of wants to drive you towards the center. And if you're on a more general path, we don't really have R as a constant radius anymore, but you can at every point define a local radius of curvature, and then this is still the acceleration. So let me sum up everything quickly. What we've shown is that these relations up here, which hold between position, velocity, and acceleration, can be used in various contexts. Most importantly, we choose the reference frame that we want and the one that is most convenient to us. Sometimes we want Cartesian coordinates with a fixed coordinate system, and then derivatives are easy. Sometimes we want polar coordinates. In that case, the same relations apply. We just have to be careful that these components are related to each other in a slightly bit more complicated fashion. Well, in the most general case, there's the space curve description where, again, we find these vectors with a slightly different representation. If you don't remember any of the details, they're in the formula collection. Just take that as a given. But let's try to apply this. And this is single particle kinematics, or all we discussed in week one. Thanks, and goodbye.